First of all, where's, where's Katie? Right here. Where is Katie? I, on behalf of my co-host Katie and I, I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, and, and most importantly, I want to thank you all for your support for the Tahir Justice Center. Um, you know, it's an incredible organization that is providing vital legal services to immigrant women and girls. And, you know, through your contributions um, during our last campaign, um, you know, they were able to expand the services they, they provide and it continue to grow. And I think we all know that the needs for those services are greater now than at any time in our history. So thank you. And we're, we're not asking for money today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back to you in December. And we'll remind you about a good time. Yeah. <laughs> She's and putting it on the tank. <laughs> and I also want to, you know, we wanted to do something different. And I really want to thank all of these wonderful artists whose pieces are in my home. If you haven't had the art tour, you will get it. Every single one of them has works here. Um, and without further ado, I am going to turn it over. First of all, this is Ben Heslop. He is the owner of Landmark Street Art, which is, you can find it on Artsy. Um, it's in northern England, near the border of Scotland. He helped me curate a lot of the art of my home, introduced me to a number of the artists. We also have Tabby, whose pieces you've seen, who is visiting us today from Austria. The boys have been out tagging New York and, and DC walls. <laughs> <laughs> this man, Blade, the king of graffiti. And again, there are books around, so please look at them. Is a legend in the graffiti movement. He's sort of the grandfather of graffiti. He's the king. And, and these two together, this is with Martha Cooper, who is a very famous street art photographer. They began their street art journey almost no, together. Way earlier. Okay. <laughs> 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 and this is uh, AIM 72, also known as the Lego guy, um, and he is joining us today from Israel. So we've got a very cross cultural section of artists, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ben to educate you a little more on the history of street art. <laughs> A bold claim for this yeah. thing that's going to be uh, so, so short. Um, thanks also to Jamie for, for making this happen. Um, we just were going to give you a little snapshot because we've got, again, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but so many generations of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's the young ones and uh, everyone else. So. <laughs> <laughs> between the age of one and twenty. Yeah, between the uh, age of... But I don't know, you guys may know nothing about it, something about it. We're just going to give you a snapshot of what it means to us and how we've all sort of interacted with it over the time. Um, as uh, you, you said, that it's kind of... My role has been meeting artists who I love, and it's such a privilege to be able to work with them as, as a job as well. Uh, and that's how it all started for me. Um, the interesting thing which you need to really realize is when this guy was picking up spray cans, there was no scene. It wasn't a thing. It was just something that he decided to do and a few others decided to do. And, and that's really interesting for me when we look at where it is today. Um, so I, the first thing I want to ask you, Blake, is when, what years are we talking when it first started for you? Uh, when it first started for myself and most of my friends at that time, it was 1972 when I was 15. And uh, we just started cutting out of school and so forth, and just going out and being knucklehead kids. Mm -hmm. And Martha Cooper came along. Yeah, but way later. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm older. Don't yeah. worry, I'm older, but it's yeah. not it's not that you're young. <laughs> but I didn't really register until more like 78, 79. Yeah, These guys were painting, we were painting, in, in, from painting their hearts out from And just a bunch of kids having a good time. Mayor Lindsay cut all the school programs and, and you know, the same stuff you hear today. And by them doing that, of course, they have to get out of school at 3 o'clock. There's nothing to do except, of course, kids getting into mischief. And when we were getting into mischief and running around and being crazy, of course, of course, when we were doing that, we were doing that and really being nuts. 
and at that time, the the government couldn't afford to uh, the, the, the government could not afford to buff and clean things, and that's what then you need. That's what I look like that guy. Long ago, so, uh, and pretty much myself and the group I was with did around five thousand trains each over like 10, 15 years time, and they pretty much put it and documented it in books. And here you have graffiti and street art all over the world today. How do you feel about, because back then obviously that was the start of the scene, and now in 2019 we see still a lot of illegal graffiti, but then mm -hmm. there's this cult of street art, which is a very different area of it. How do you, from when you were getting cans of red lead back in the day to specific events and stores and the whole theme of street art being such a big thing now. How do you see that kind of journey? Is it, do you think it's a positive thing? And I think it's positive because the, the art books have pretty much changed the, uh, the way people look at graffiti and street art globally. And uh, it's something that seems fascinating to most people other than, of course, your basic stuff. You see museums, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, great artwork, but to see something completely different all over the world just from something that happened in New York for a bunch of knucklehead kids mm -hmm. having yeah, a good time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that definitely would not have been anywhere near where it is today if it wasn't for Martha. And she'll go, oh, no, but not I mean, just, you know, this uh, wouldn't have been. This book was two people did this book. Yeah, sorry, Henry Shelfart yeah, as well. He's not here today. But. So uh, when you started, because you were, was you a pool photographer at the time, or were you working for the Post? I was working for a um, daily newspaper in New York. In and New what York made place. you turn your attention um, to what I was you were doing seeing? a project on kids, a personal project on kids being creative. Uh, as I drove back to the newspaper every day, I would take pictures of kids out in vacant lots, and one boy showed me his notebook, and he explained that he was practicing to put his name on walls, not trains, actually. And that was the first time that I understood that what I had seen, this graffiti that I'd seen all over the place, that these were nicknames because it wasn't actually evident. People didn't really know what they were seeing. And I want to say something about graffiti and street art. Graffiti is really about letters, about writing your name. Now, you do have some street art, like this vandalism right here, mm -hmm. that is about letters. But mostly, graffiti is letters, and street art can be images. And graffiti is pretty much spray can and marker, where street art can be absolutely anything. It can be knitting. It can be tiles, like Invader. It can be any kind of medium. Uh, but graffiti is pretty much, wouldn't you say, marker, spray paint. Yeah, spray paint and marker. And and now they have companies, yeah, companies that are manufacturing spray paint in hundreds of different colors just for graffiti writers. And you're paying? Mm -hmm. it's not that. No, it was just one thing. <laughs> yeah. Certain colors and everything had lead in it. And only a couple mm -hmm. of friends of mine ended up having... Uh, traces of lead in their blood to this day, you know, because that's what was in the paint. You didn't think about it, you're just 15. You roll a joint, you get in the trunk, and you have it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, right? There was nothing else to it. But there was a little bit else to it, because they used different caps to get yeah. the different sprays, so yeah. that they would look for oven cleaners, yeah, you to go to the supermarket, you to go to the supermarket and looking take the to tops off oven cleaner. Mm -hmm. To, so to, to make the paint come out bigger, because you know you don't have a lot of time there, because you know the cops are coming. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so they made their own tools. Where now there are yes. huge companies making these spray caps, every kind of spray caps you can imagine. But I still know guys who make their own caps. I always, I, I like to photograph the tools and techniques because I love to see. Um, the artists who are able to make their own, you know, create their own tools. And when we were doing a, a talk beforehand, the shot I had that interested you most was Joe, you, your setup shot of the how you get the wall done before the finished product, and that's you know that's where the interest lies. How were you received by people like Blake? Obviously, you're going to say he was lovely, but <laughs> like in general, I knew his work way before I ever met Blake. So in know? general, so when of course you, I wanted to meet him. In, in your studio when we went to church. Yeah. I got to this in the picture. Yeah, and we, so. Somebody made it so we got to. I didn't want to meet anybody, of course, over 40 because old people <laughs> must be with the cops. <laughs> 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 so. Was that a 
in general, was it was it received well when you you took interest in someone's sort of work and what they were doing, or were they suspicious? Or um, you know, photography was always an important part of um, the documentation. Documentation yeah. because if you didn't have a picture of your work, um, there was no proof that you had ever done it. And Blade is one of the few people who actually did document. I have a picture of Blade with all your. Yeah. He had photo albums mm -hmm. and documented it himself. However. Mm -hmm. I was a professional photographer. Most of the graffiti writers had um, the little cardboard one-time use cameras. Yeah. So I could provide better pictures. Mm -hmm. And so I think graffiti has always been something where you're admired for your skills. Like anybody could be a graffiti writer if they were good at it. Well, I was good at photography, so that was my <laughs> entree into the world. I was able to give them good pictures, and I always tried to give back on those of the trains. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they cared who yeah, I was. They wanted the pictures. Yeah, pictures were the important thing. And she's getting great shots, straight shots. Henry's getting straight shots. The shots that my friends and I took, of course, you're really on a station, mm -hmm. taking the picture, and then of course running. So <laughs> the pictures, they're, never, they're never really so good. No high mm -hmm. res. Yeah, no high res, no shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 None of that stuff. So then moving it forwards um, to a um, Manchester. Starting in the 80s was where, is that where you say it began for you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, around 1984, 85, I was 12 years old, sort of on Beak Street, um, Subway Art had first come into the UK. It was published in the UK <clears throat> because we could not find an American publisher. Mm -hmm. We well, looked everywhere, nobody wanted it, but Hanson Hudson published it in England. Um, this was uh, the only really reference uh, that we had to any, any graffiti in the UK. Um, I, it just drew me in straight away at the age of 12. And um, this book, you know, it, uh, certainly for the old school, it's known as, as the Bible, as a, as a graffiti writer's Bible. And, uh, you know, my generation still today uh, refer to it uh, as the Bible. But um, I was drawn in in the 80s. Um, I've painted every year since, you know, I'm uh, 14 something years old. <laughs> and, um, I'll admit, I, st I still enjoy doing the illegals today. <laughs> 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 and I still enjoy photographing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some adrenaline rush. There's something about it that, that just never goes away. And, you know, I've kind of um, transferred into street art a lot with, with the stencils and the Lego stuff, which is basically what I've been doing for a living for the last 14 years. But um, like Martha said, you know, graffiti uh, is about letters, it's about names, it's about getting your name up. And even when we were doing it back then, we didn't care what the public saw in it. It, it, was, it was for us and it was for other artists. And that was it, it was very underground, it, it was very unknown. Um, and there was a lot of fun in the discovery uh, of the mixing the paint and, and the different caps and all these techniques which, you know, you couldn't go on the internet and get this. It, just such a fun it time. It wasn't an internet. It was an amazing time. Yeah. And, um, we used to come up with these crazy techniques. Like Even in England, we didn't have any of the paint. We didn't have the pinks and the purples. So we used to get a red and a white can, and we'd stick the white can in boiling hot water and get a WD-40 straw, and then when the can heated up to the point that it probably wasn't that safe, <laughs> you'd push the caps down and the paint would be going everywhere. But what it would do is it would push the white into the into the red or vice versa, and you get pink. And uh, this is how we've been making colours. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a fun time. And um, you know, obviously, you've got this massive scene today with the internet and street art and stuff, and it's a very commercial scene. Um, but it enables to do what we love to do. And um, for me, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big, big part of my life, uh, and it always will be. How is the crossover between graffiti and street art? Did you see a crossover, or do you see two different camps that you like to to, to have a foot in each, or um, you combine it as well? Well, even though I see myself as both today, okay. as a street artist and a graffiti artist, I, I still um, I won't put my street art over tags or pieces or dubs or throws or anything graffiti. For me, that's still a no-no. You know, graffiti always comes first, and then it's the street art after. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, so, and then moving further on to Tabby, um, where, where, how long have you been spraying in the streets, basically? Uh, I started about 2013. 
I started just making making it for myself at home. Eventually, I just had a collection. I thought, you know, I'll just bring it out. And um, I started with stencils because I have a very short attention span. And I always I started projects and I never finish them because I get interested in the next project. So I've never finished anything. And stencils was the first thing where I start in the day and I have a finished thing at the end of the night. So that was like, okay, this is my thing. I can. I can get an idea or a story and actually bring it out before I get bored, and so I just stuck with that. And your work um, is, although they're only like singular pieces, they really do tell a story that you see in work, and it's often based around humour. So, where does your kind of where do you get your subjects and your stories from? Because one thing I think you do well is you really you fit a lot into a stationary piece of art. You know, there's a whole scene going on in there. Where does that come from? Um, like, it just becomes wanting to connect with people. So not every piece has to connect with everybody, but eventually everybody finds one piece that they can connect with. So it's just it's just always being open to what's going around in the world, what's important now, what was important in the past, what needs to be highlighted. So it's just trying to get to know what everybody's thinking about and not making every piece work for everybody, but trying to find specific things where everybody can dig into it and, and just find something that relates to them. And the theme of humor being like a groundbreaker? Or? Um, yeah, humor is like a universal language, so you can be serious, but you still like to laugh. My dad was a hard worker business suit, but he would sit with the comic in the comic pages in the morning in the newspaper and laugh about it, mm -hmm. but otherwise it'd be very no-nonsense. Mm -hmm. So humor is a way to connect people with messages no matter who you are in the world, because everybody likes to laugh. And so that's a good way to highlight something, especially if it's important. If you just say, this is bad and you're a terrible person, nobody's gonna change, but if you can make the person laugh about it himself, then he'll be like, okay, I get your point. So, <laughs> So, without trying to make this into 60 minutes, uh, <laughs> I don't want to bore you guys too much, but um, that's like a, a, a literally such a, a bizarre <laughs> snapshot of, of, of a real generational spread of, of how some things that you may see and have had no experience of where it's come from or why it's there might sort of shed some light on that. Um, has anyone got any burning questions, just like one or two that they want to ask really quickly, or are you, uh, you all thinking? Overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So being from Philadelphia, where I grew up in, would you consider the mural art like that happens in Philadelphia City, City area to be a street art, or would you consider it to be something that is specific to the? Are you looking at me? She can answer it better. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at all you. Know, when I, I think of the mural art in Philadelphia as being um, a community mural art as being a little bit different from either graffiti or street art because those definitely, they're within the communities and they usually have a message that relates to the particular community that they're in. Often street art does too, but Philadelphia mural art is it's very happy art. <laughs> Where street art isn't necessarily. I would say street art has a wider range of topics that people might address, whereas in Philadelphia, I think they really just want to celebrate the communities of the art. I, I, I don't mean, when I say just, I don't mean to belittle the art. There's yeah. some amazing artists working in Philadelphia. And I've gone to Philly a couple of times and I've looked at the, the mural art there, and that's a, it's an incredible program. I don't know how many they've done, but probably like thousands, right? Yeah. That, that program has been going on longer than almost any other mural program. But I do see it as different from what we're talking about here. A little bit different. Anyone else? I have a quick question. Um, I wanted to see if we could talk a little bit about how you think about your art and the way it interacts with social media. Because I like in I, one of the places I consider home is Birmingham and Alabama, and I can think of a couple places that where like street art has become like one of the things that you go see when you're a tourist in Alabama or you take pictures in front of and I was like when I was thinking about this party I could like think of the, like my sisters and I taking pictures in front of what I think is street art and so I just didn't know like how do you guys think about that kind of use of of your work well, I mean I have, I, can have, 
I uh, work for um, some people who own what's called Willow Walls in Miami. And I've uh, shot for them for 10 years. This is the 10th year we're doing a book of it. Those walls become backdrops for photographs. And people make fun of that, but I actually, I think it's a wonderful way for people to interact with art. I see whole families with little kids and bigger kids and they're posing their family. And that may be the first connection that those kids have to art. And it's to me, it's a lot more interesting than dragging them into some museum and making them look at a picture on the wall. Um, and for sure, the social media, like I'm a big Instagrammer. At Martha Instagram. And you know, I love the feedback that I get on Instagram, which it's, it's like self-publishing. It enables me to take a picture of a piece of street art or somebody making painting, put it immediately on Instagram, get comments. Otherwise, those pictures used to sit in my files and are still sitting in my files for years, probably never to get out of my files. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm like pro social media. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think there's, my... there's, there's two points to it as well. Um, Weirdly enough, owning a street art company in the UK, the city which I live in had no street art. <laughs> you made it strange, it was a bit of a strange business choice there. <laughs> like, philanthropically, my, I felt my goal was to bring street art to this city, which had no colour, and that was nothing to do with the commercialism of it. And I've been very lucky with some of the people I've met, and I've been managing to get artists over. So in the, like, the last year, we've got 10 different artists from all over the world to come and paint mainly out of their own schedule and out of my kind of desire to see it happen rather than any kind of fixed event and just organizing the right people with the right walls. And like Martha said, in a place which has no street art, the council can pay as much money, or the municipality can pay as much money to put an event on in a room about the size of this for three weeks and call it a success because the same people from the same groups come and go, oh, that was amazing. <laughs> Whereas what I've instantly done is given a town, a city of 70,000 people who are going to buy milk, take their children to the park, go to work, they're confronted with this. And I think that's a really interesting conversation to start for any place. And the artists really get that and the documenters really get that too. But the flip side of, I think, is maybe what you were touching on is artists get really mad when the commercialization of their work happens and normally by a big company, nothing to do with anything that we guys are setting up, and suddenly there's an advert and they pick that area because they've got this in. And sometimes artists want to collaborate on something like that, which is great. But other times the company just goes, oh, we want to be edgy, we want to, you know, that's a great piece, let's use that. Like, you know, we have paper on the street. Mm -hmm. And that is where friction can occur. And rightfully so, in, in my eyes, I can't speak for anyone else. Because that's someone's life's work, their talent, and it's now being a big company who's already worth millions, is now being able to appear as one thing for nothing. Uh, and nothing goes back to the artist. So. Which means... Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to the